welcome back to my art vlog. I do really appreciate that you are here. If you are a repeat watcher, thank you so much. If you're a subscriber, an extra, extra thanks. And if you're new, welcome to the art vlog. Um, you haven't missed much. This is only my fourth video. This is the second part of a two-part series though. Um, so if you want, you can go ahead and watch that first part. I um, literally started a daily art practice in November. In the 10 years prior to that, I was not doing it daily. I would do it sometimes once a week, sometimes once or twice a month. I don't think it ever amounted to more than 20 times per year, uh, depending on the year and how busy I was at my day job. Um, and I realized that a lot of it was because of false beliefs I had um, around art and artists that made me feel foolish about starting a daily art practice as an adult. And I'm here to share those beliefs with you so that you can let go of those beliefs and that you can save 10 years of your life. Um, you can cut out of, that, out of that 10 years of hesitation that I had and you can start a regular art practice today. When you fin finish watching this video, you will start a regular art practice today. Um, that is my hope. Please share with me if you do. I would love to know. And thank you so much for um, watching my videos. If you like them, please do subscribe and like them. I'm actually not going to speak to you the whole time the way I did in my last video. This is um, the Kremer Portrait Palette Incarnate that I will swatch for you. Um, it was requested by one of the viewers that I do swatch it. It came um, with a little swatch card which I might have already lost. So I'm gonna go ahead and swatch it for you and I'm gonna do it on a nice watercolor paper because I think it shows it best. And then I have a couple of recent favorites starting uh, with I think a couple of weeks ago. I finally, um, I got this as a part of the many um, art supplies I bought over the past, you know, I bought the whole universe the past six months, well, since November. I actually blame it on all the haul videos I watched on YouTube. I started watching YouTube videos in November um, and I they have enabled me to buy art supplies and I feel like I am participating by enabling other people to buy art supplies but do be careful there are worse addictions but do not go into credit card debt for this because it's not worth it um, you only need so many art supplies in the end it's about how you use them, not how much you have. Okay, going back to these two sets, this is the M. Graham watercolor jewel set. This is my first honey-based watercolors. I do love them. They, um, they feel sticky in a good way compared to the gum Arabic watercolors. So this is the jewel tone watercolor set. I love the blue in here. And I love the red in here. And the red actually makes a very wonderful orange color when mixed with a schminky. And I'm going to show you that orange color in a little illustration I did using it. Um, and then the other thing I will swatch for you is the Cobalt M. Graham watercolor set. Um, this was also bought on Amazon. These were on a huge sale on Amazon. Normally I actually buy my art supplies from Dick Blick. Okay, myth number six. I have to wait for inspiration in order to make art. I should wait for inspiration to make art. Otherwise, why do it? Absolutely not. Because if you wait for inspiration to do art, you almost never will. We have, in general, fairly routine lives. And if you don't train your eye to see something in a beautiful way, Lots of moments are just moments, days, weeks, months, and years are going to pass by before you get any sort of inspiration to do that art form. I mean, it depends on the person. Maybe some people are more um, engaged. I don't know. But in general, you will be missing many opportunities to sit down and make art regularly if you wait for inspiration. The greatest of artists never did this. Most people who are very skilled at what they do, they don't wait for inspiration to kick in for them to do that thing. They actually just sit down and they do it. 
And I know this can be hard and scary to do if it's not something you're used to, but it's a habit. Art is a habit. And when you do it regularly, you notice that it becomes more and more easily. The other thing is when you don't wait for inspiration to arrive, you train your brain to look at something ordinary and then turn it into something that's really pretty. And a lot of times you might actually just end up surprising yourself. Um, I will make a video on what I have done to make the barrier to entry of an art session low so that you are not frightened um, and that you're not uh, wondering what you should paint or how you should do it. But in general, do not wait for inspiration. I did this um, as the big, probably one of the biggest reasons I waited 10 years from a daily art practice is because I would come home tired or it was a generally routine day and I didn't feel inspired in any way artistically. Um, but then in November when I got my Leela, the original Leela, and I started doing a daily sketchbook, I started realizing that even if I were uh, painting something that looked quite ordinary, it actually ended up coming out in a way that I really loved. So I just started doing pictures from Map Crunch, which I love. I love Map Crunch. If you guys don't know, just Google Map Crunch. It's this Google thing where they show you random um, parts of the world, like random street scenes, um, and it's free. And you're, as far as I know, you can go ahead and make artwork from that. I don't think it's um, in any way limited. Um, I sometimes just Google people and I will sketch faces off of that even if they're not the most interesting faces, if they're just normal, regular human faces. I will go ahead and practice making them and sometimes I'm just really pleased with the way it comes out and I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, and you won't teach your brain to figure out how to make something interesting even if it isn't interesting. A lot, if you saw the reference, um, the reference viewpoints of many of the famous paintings you know of you you know you'd be like how 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 do you look at that and then make this um, but they've trained their eyes to do this and the way a lot of those artists train their eyes to do this is by not waiting for inspiration by by sitting down and doing it and i promise you that once you do it regularly it does become easier because it's a habit it really is just an art habit Okay, myth number seven. I'm wasting my art supplies if I don't make good art. I wouldn't use my good art supplies even though I had accumulated a lot um, because it's basically what I spend my fun money on. I used to spend my fun money on clothes and then 2020 happened and I never went anywhere. So I started buying art supplies instead, but I wasn't using the art supplies. I have, I've realized three um, different uh, Arches paper. Actually, I probably have four or five different Arches paper blocks and I have not used them because they're so expensive and I'm like, oh my God, it's going to go to waste. But now I made a decision also in November and when I started buying all of these art supply hauls that I'm going to try to get through as much art supplies as possible by 2024. In fact, I'm going to throw a party if I get through half of my art supplies, it's not gonna happen because I have way too much. But um, my goal is to use up my art supplies. That is what they are for. You don't buy art supplies to stare at them. Maybe there's one like tiny, super expensive palette that, okay, you're gonna like just reach for occasionally. But the vast majority of the art supplies you buy, you are buying to use. And the greatest gift you can give an art supply, because we have to honor our art supplies, the greatest gift we can give our art supplies is to actually use them. Art supplies get sad if you just put them on a shelf and you don't use them. They want to be used. And you, when you see those bright colors, when you see how something looks amazing because you use a nicer art supply, you will get more excited also about your artwork. It's not a waste. It's not a waste because it's going to inspire you to do more. The other thing is, if you are doing art and you are making shitty art, you are learning from something. We learn more from our failures than we do from our non-failures, from our successes.
non-failures. We learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. When I make a portrait that's wrong and off, I can look at it and look at the picture and be like, okay, this, this forehead doesn't look right. I can see that the eye is not where it should be. I can see that maybe the nose is too wide or the nose is too narrow. And that is what I learned from. If I um, get lucky and just get it right the first time, honestly, if I'm a beginner artist, I'm not going to be able to replicate that very easily. And I'll, I'll also look at it and be like, oh, okay, everything looks pretty decent. But I won't really learn. I won't really know how I did it. But if I make a mistake, I can see what I did wrong. And then I can try in the next um in the next project or painting or drawing to do it better. So do not not use your art supplies. Do use your art supplies. It is absolutely not a waste and you should want to use it up. And those art supplies, they, they will be elated. Those art supplies will be elated that you use them. One of the saddest things, especially is if you just keep an art supply on the shelf, and they are no longer usable. I bought a Holbein designer gouache set where half of, and I bought it, I don't know how long I bought it, it must have been over two years ago. Half of the gouache is dried up and unusable. I tried to boil, I literally tried boiling it in water, it didn't work. Um, and that is so sad. And then I, I noticed like one of my M. Graham gouaches is also like clogged up um, and and so now I have all my gouaches out and I'm gonna use up all the gouaches. I suck at doing gouache. And these, some of these gouaches, they're more expensive brands and they're hard, you know, so, and the tubes are tiny, but my goal is it is so much better to use up this tube of Hooker's Green than to just let it go to waste. It is not wasting an art supply if you're using it, it's wasting an art supply if you don't use it. I have finally learned at the age of 40 that failing in many ways is better than not failing, especially in art. The reason failing is better than not failing is because if you're not failing in art, then that might actually mean that you are not taking risks and you are not doing something new and you are not pushing yourself. And if you're not taking risks and you're like, if you can make a really fantastic smiley face, like that smiley face looks like the smiley face that the guy who invited smiley faces makes, and you're not trying to make another type of portrait. Listen, you may have uh, succeeded quite well with that smiley face, but you actually ended up failing at art because you didn't push yourself to do something beyond what you think your limits are. You did not take that risk to go beyond where you are right now. So that is actually the true failure, is to not take risks to learn something new. Whether that's in art or in normal life, our biggest failure is, not, is in not trying. Our biggest failure is in not trying because if you keep succeeding and succeeding and succeeding and succeeding and succeeding without any missteps or failures, it actually just means you've stayed in your comfort zone. And that's not necessarily a good thing, nor does it make for a very exciting life or art practice. So again, you didn't buy those pretty art supplies to sit on a shelf. You bought those pretty art supplies to make shitty art after shitty art after shitty art and then learn from your super shitty art because that is how you make good art by making lots and lots and lots of shitty art. So my goal really, my goal when I sit down is not to make beautiful art, it's to make shitty art. And um, sometimes I surprise myself. Myth number eight. We see making bad art as a moral failure. This is separate from a general failure, aesthetic failure. We see it as a moral failure. Now, few people would vocalize saying, oh, me making bad art is a moral failure. Very few people in this world would actually vocalize it that way. But sometimes as adults, and I, it, I guess I briefly touched on this in my previous video, but sometimes as adults, if we sit down and we do something for fun and it doesn't come out the way we want it to, we see it as a failure, a moral, a, not just like a failure, but a moral failure that we wasted our time and that we were wasting our life and that we didn't um, 
spend it doing something more constructive and maybe helping uh, people in our family out or having a conversation with a friend that could have helped that I mean I don't know just come up with whatever scenario that you think would have been better spent than if you had sat down making um, drawings with these really beautiful, look at how beautiful these markers are, with these really beautiful markers that didn't come out the way you wanted to. Um, something inside you tells you that you're a moral failure for wasting time. In, in our, in, um, I don't really know how to, to quite, quite to vocalize this, but sometimes our our bodies, our minds will actually give us feelings of guilt and embarrassment. The way you feel guilty or embarrassed if you truly did something morally disgusting. But that's silly. It's, it's silly to feel guilt or shame. Um, and we have to listen to our emotions in our bodies and tell ourselves, no, that doesn't make any sense. That that I'm reacting that way because maybe I'm neurologically geared as a human being to think that way, but no, this logically, if I sit down and think about this, it doesn't make sense that making shitty art is a moral failure. Um, because what happens? What happens honestly in life if we make bad art? What could possibly happen if we make bad art? Will somebody die? The way you might make mistakes in medicine, if you make a really bad mistake in medicine, if you make really ugly medicine, um, yeah, people can die if you make really ugly medicine. People can die. But if you're making really ugly art or really bad art or art that you think is ugly, no one is going to die. You're not going to die. Nobody you know is going to die of bad artwork that you made. Um, the economy will not collapse. It may not be the greatest economy right now. It depends on who you're speaking to. But there won't be a free fall of our economy. We're not going to enter the barter system just because you made bad art. We really won't. I promise that we're not going to. If, if we enter barter system, it's not because of you. It's because of a whole collection of things going on in society. Society will not collapse if you make bad art. So... When your mind starts getting afraid of that white sheet of paper, it's scary because it's an unknown and your body says to you, oh my God, um, stop, stop, that's unknown. And your body evolutionarily has been primed to view the uncertain and the unknown as scary because the uncertain and the unknown in the caveman area could lead to your death. I mean, if, if you walk into a dark cave being like, I'm going to make really cool um, art on the side of that cave wall so people a thousand years from now can see my cave art or 10,000 years from now can see my cave art. But you don't check out whether or not there's a bear in that cave. Yeah, you probably would have died if there were a bear in that cave. But you know what? Unless you're camping, there's no bear in your living room or office, wherever you are. There's no, there's there's nothing there that's going to kill you because you make bad art. So do not feel bad. Do not feel bad making bad art. It is so important to know that the pathway to making really excellent, amazing art, art that you're just happy with is to make shitty art. There's really no way about around it. You, it's like learning a language. You have to make mistakes speaking a language in order to learn that language. One of my greatest um, disappointments in my educational process is I took French for 10 years and I can actually read it fluently. I can write it proficiently. I can't speak it very well and it's pretty embarrassing that I can read Marcel Proust, which is a very difficult French author to read in the original French and not have an issue understand him. But I, it's very difficult for me to carry a converse, a, just a normal conversation in French. And the reason is because I was embarrassed in making mistakes with speaking. And with writing, you know, you can think about what you're writing and make it. But because I didn't practice speaking, um, because I was too afraid of making mistakes, I never really learned to speak French correctly. And so 
that is the primary reason actually adults don't pick up learning things it's not really it's not because they don't have neuroplasticity a lot of data has shown that adults do have tons of neuroplasticity you could have a stroke and lose everything and your brain um, can relearn everything not everyone is like that but a lot of people a lot your brain is very capable even as an adult even as a 60 70 80 year old of learning new things the reason um, we don't learn new things is because we have learned as adults to be scared of learning new things because of our histories or we are tired and we don't want to learn new things. And the tiredness doesn't come necessarily from a physical tiredness. It comes from all of the other obligations we have in life. Children have lots of time on their hands. College students have lots of time on their hands. That's why when they learn something new, it's primarily because they leap into it, they're not afraid, and they do it, um, they embrace it passionately and do it a lot. Older adults, especially as, as we get into our 40s, 50s, or 60s, we don't jump the way little kids do into everything. But if you do it that way and you let go of that embarrassment and that guilt and that shame and the idea of moral failure and the fear of the unknown, you will be able to learn art surprisingly well and probably surprisingly quickly. You just have to let go of your inhibitions of these thoughts that keep you from doing it. So again, the zombie apocalypse will not happen if you don't, if you make bad art. We will not have an alien invasion if you make bad art. You are not a moral failure. You are not a waste of space. You are not an embarrassment because you took some time and made bad art. If you enjoyed it, then you're absolutely awesome. And that was time well spent. It's great for your mental health. And you need to do it again and again and again like a dog playing in fresh snow or a child with a new set of 60 Crayola crayons. I still get tempted to buy them even though I have the Caron Dash. Is it Caron Dash or is it Caron Dosh? <laughs> Caron Dash. Anyway, I still sometimes get tempted to buy those 60-pack Crayolas even though I know I have high-grade professional art supplies. Okay, number nine. Art is silly or art is serious. Now this depends on what kind of personality you have that whether art is silly is inhibiting you or that the idea that art is serious is inhibiting you depends on your personality or or, or the particular time of your life. Um, But these statements, it can be both. It can be silly, it can be serious, it can be neither silly nor serious, it can just be. Art can just be. It can literally be whatever you want it to be. That is the genius of art. It is completely malleable to what we want it to be. And we, we, we as human beings, those of us who have chosen art as our hobby or our passion, we are so lucky that we picked art as one of our passions um, and as one of our adventures in life. Honestly, we're just geniuses. We should win awards just for deciding that art is our hobby. We really should. Um, And that's because it is so malleable, so expansive, so um, universal, and so infinite. Only a true genius would pick art as a hobby because it is so universal. Uh, Think of all those fools out there following passions with strict rules and limitations. They're a bunch of dum-dums. We were the geniuses. And you remember that the next time you face that paper, that blank piece of paper, you say to yourself, I am a genius. Number 10, improvement in art is a constant. No, it absolutely is not. Um, There are going to be uh, days where you like progress really quickly, but then there's going to be a few weeks where you don't. And then there's going to be a few weeks or months where you're progressing quickly. And then you're going to hit a wall for three months and not progress. Um, and and by, pro- progre- progress, by progress, what I mean is that you are not seeing that your art is leveling upwards, whatever that might mean to you. Um, you might still make art that you like, but you might not see that you're leveling up to whatever next level you're aiming for. It's so different for everybody. I can't really give you an example. Um, But 
It's a false belief to think that improvement in art is going to be one straight constant uh, positive slope. It's going to have um, valleys and um, peaks and dips and rises. It might even loop around like a roller coaster. Um, and that's one of the most exciting things about art is because you don't know where you're going to be a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. That is part of the excitement. Um, so don't, if you feel like you've hit a rut, don't feel that, um, don't feel like that that's the end for you and you're never going to get better again, uh, again. Yes, you will. You can, you know, you can always try something new, buy new art supplies. Um, even though I'm trying to not enable people to buy art supplies, even though I am, because I'm totally going to do more art haul videos. Um, but basically art improvement in art is not a constant. It's false to believe that it would happen constantly in, in a steady manner. And part of the joy is the surprises in how we improve. And then I actually have a bonus myth. It's sort of more like a little jewel. I don't, I don't even know if it's like a bad myth to have but it's sort of like a nice jewel to get art has an end point it doesn't have an end point and that's because it's infinite there's so many infinite possibilities that you can always take more risks you can always do new things you can always push yourself it is so wonderfully infinite the combinations of um, mediums and subjects and lines and marks um, and papers and everything that we can use art there can really be no end point in art if you've reached a point in art where you're like I'm done this is where I want to go I don't need to do anymore hey if that makes you happy that's totally fine um, but then your art practice has sort of um, turned into more of like um, a pastime than an evolving art practice. Um, so take it as a jewel that we will probably never arrive at an end point where we feel that we've reached our destination. I'm, I'm not sure I would be happy if I ended up with an end destination in art. I, I really wouldn't. I would probably keep trying to do new things and keep trying to push myself. I know I've got a long way to go, but that is my hope. That brings us to the end of our 10 myths plus a little jewel. I hope that you enjoyed it and it added a little bit to your day. If you did like this video, please click like and subscribe. It would really help me out and help me bring more videos to you. The next video will be a glorious, beautiful, large art haul from Dick Blick. And by large, I mean absolutely massive. So have an absolutely wonderful day and I hope you join me next time.